So um, we do have an outstanding author for you today, Albert Samaha, who is an investigative journalist and inequality editor at BuzzFeed News. He's the author of Conception and Immigrants' Family Fortunes. His work has appeared in the New York Times, The Village Voice, San Francisco Weekly, and the Riverfront Times, among our out other outlets. A Whiting Foundation Creative Nonfiction Grants recipient, he is also the author of Never Run, Ran, Never Will, Boyhood, and Football in a Changing American City, which was a finalist for the 2019 P PEN, SPN Literary Awards, Writing Award, and winner of the New York Society Library's 2019 Home Hornblower Award. He lives in Brooklyn. Please welcome Albert, Albert to Brattleboro. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Appreciate you guys uh, spending your time here with me today. I will try to carry the load for two, so I hope this is uh, worthwhile for everybody. Um, mostly just going to talk about my experience working on this book, um, the lessons I learned. Um, I, I know there will be a Q&A at the end, um, but I also sort of just welcome everybody. Just raise your hand. If there's something I say you know, that you have a question about or you want to discuss, feel free to just raise your hand. This is a small, um, intimate enough gathering that you know that's not going to derail us. Um, and maybe we can turn it into a conversation as well. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Albert Samaha, uh, author of Conception, uh, Conquest, Colonialism, and an Immigrant Families' Fortunes, um, a book um, I began working on officially in 2018, but spiritually probably even further uh, beyond that, probably as far back as 2009. And technically, I started reporting the book in 1989 when I was born, um, because such is the experience of working on memoirs. And I, I think the experience um, of working on this book and really the origins uh, for why I wanted to work on this book uh, was trying to understand uh, the forces that ultimately led to me being an American um, and, and, and led to me being a part of the superpower, the empire of our age um, and, and exploring what duties came with that um, and what forces led my elders um, to come from here. Um, so to sort of begin with the initial conception of, of the book, I um, had, had not really been planning to write a memoir. Um, as, as you heard in my introduction, I'm an investigative journalist. I spent my careers focusing on the lives of other people's families, you know, exposing uh, the deep, dark secrets uh, that I have nothing to do with, um, and, and, and went a decade of my career without ever writing the words I or me uh, in print. Uh, so it was quite a sort of stark turn for me to realize that I wanted to write about my family. And, and what sparked that was, um, Around the time I, I reached, I was reaching the age my mom was uh, when she was in the States. She came, uh, she migrated from the Philippines to the U.S. Um, when she was around 29, 30. And by the time I got to that age, you know, I'd sort of been racked with these questions of just sort of the empathy of what was it like for her to start fresh in a new place? You know, I was sort of beginning this, 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 this new stage of adulthood where I was finally um, financially stable. Um, I had sort of graduated in the teeth of the recession and landed on my feet in an industry that was shrinking. I was doing okay. I was paying my bills. I was helping support my mom and was generally happy with uh, my station, my, my, my place as an upwardly mobile young American um, in a place where so many people continue to struggle. Um, among them was my mom and a lot of my aunties and uncles who, um, even though they had been here uh, for 30 years, trying to build momentum in their American lives, um, were struggling more than they ever had before. You know, they were struggling to pay the bills, struggling to make rent. Uh, the foreclosures of 2008, 2009, 2010 continued to set them back. The bankruptcies from that period continued to set them back. And they had never really regained their, their footing. Uh, like a lot of people across the country, across the Western world, um, the past 10, 20 years uh, has been a downward slide. And it sort of occurred to me to wonder um, whether it was worth it. You know, my, uh, I had heard stories about my family's life in the Philippines um, from before I was born. Uh, and they were wealthy. They were upper middle class. Uh, my grandfather on my mom's side was a lawyer who handled uh, uh, civil defense cases. Uh, my grandmother on her side uh, was an accountant who worked for the central bank. Uh, whose best friend uh, was the was the was the sister of a high-ranking, uh, powerful sen uh, senator or congressperson in the Philippines. Uh, we lived, or they lived, before I was born, in a big house with uh, with with a big compound with three houses and a lot of rooms, a whole staff of drivers, nannies, maids. It was the sort of 
you know, upper echelon experience that I could only fantasize about living in here. I can't imagine ever having, I don't know if anyone here has a driver or, or a housekeeper, um, but I couldn't even imagine having a, a whole staff of that. And yet in the Philippines, that is what we had. And so the juxtaposition of, of knowing the comforts my family has had, had had in the Philippines, and then half a century later, one generation later, um, it was sort of all gone, and they were all sort of starting from scratch. So I sort of began this project with the same sort of investigative ambitions as I have on any other project, except this time it was trained on the lens of my family's experience and trying to answer the question, why did they come here and whether it was worth it. Um, the first question uh, was a lot easier to answer than the second. You know, the question of why they came here is a matter of historical record. Um, it's a story that begins long before America even existed as a country, um, or was even present on the maps of, of Europeans. Um, it began all the way back when Ferdinand Magellan took his uh, boat, uh, well, his, his fleet of, of, of five ships, um, and sailed across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, um, and, and embarked to try to become the first crew, the first expedition to circumnavigate the globe. Um, the sort of story of, of, of why Magellan ended up taking on this role is rooted in the story of why it was that Europe ended up discovering the new world and not the other way around. And that is the story of the struggle of Europe uh, during the, the 14th, 15th, and 16th century. You know, at the time, you know, now we think, when we think of Europe and we think of the ancient history of Europe, right, we think of these powerful, proud monarchies. We think of all these amazing discoveries and, and monuments that continue to exist today. You know, I was just in Europe over the summer and I immersed in that history, the big buildings, uh, the castles that have been around for 500 years, the art that flourished, you know, over the, over the Renaissance, over that period. Because of all that cultural history, um, it's very easy to forget what Europe was like even before that. And what Europe was like before that was an isolated, fragmented continent on the edge of the known world of Eurasia. The dominant powers uh, of that time period in that part of the world uh, was China, uh, but China was so powerful that they felt no need to explore beyond their boundaries, boundaries right? They, they put all their resources on building a wall, on making sure they protected the ancient empire that they had built thousands of years earlier. The next most powerful empire of the time were the Ottomans. Um, they were right in the middle of Eurasia, so they were thriving because they had all these different factions and cultures at the center of the spice trade in the Mediterranean. But they sort of had a lot of different federations and factions they were trying to keep together. They couldn't really focus on this idea of expansion because they were just trying to hold together this empire that had sort of come together around this period in the middle of kind of the second millennia. So that leaves Europe. And at that time, uh, Europe was in a really tough spot geopolitically because they were all the way at the edge of the known world and between them and the main, the main trading hubs of the Mediterranean were a ton of enemies, both European enemies, Ottoman em enemies, um, and, and, and they clashed. So Spain and Portugal had it worst because I don't know if you guys have seen maps recently, but they're the furthest on the edge of the ocean. So if they wanted to get what, what, what the, 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 the spice trade and everything else was bringing to the Mediterranean, they had to cross through all of this territory of enemies. So what did they do? They developed ships. And they started to figure out, is there a, is, are there maritime routes that they can use to get to these trade routes? Uh, Portugal was the first to develop a ship powerful enough, sturdy enough, to go all the way around the southern horn of Africa and reach the Indian Ocean and have uh, direct lines of trades to Asia. Uh, their main rival, Spain, was jealous of this, so they tried to develop their own ships, and eventually they did. Um, and, 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 and this sort of led to the competition that, that sharpened each other, because Europe knew that if they wanted to get to the trade routes, um, they had to develop oceanic routes. Their, their, their shipbuilding capacities accelerated. This is where they put in all their resources. So Spain sees, okay, their, their big rival, Portugal, has discovered a route to Asia, Spain tries to mimic that route, but then their ships keep getting bombed and pirated by Portuguese ships because Portugal's not letting Spain get in on any of this action. So Spain's like, okay, well maybe we can go around, right? This is what Columbia, Columbus ends up doing for Spain. Columbus tries to find them a route to the other, you know, across the Atlantic to Asia um, because it meant getting around Portugal. He does that, he gets to the Americas, it wasn't 
Asia. They still have to figure out a way to get to Asia. Magellan goes to Spain and says, I have another route. I have another idea. I think we'll just go around the other ocean that we already know exists. And so he does that. And after, I think it was like six to eight months um, of traveling across the Pacific, eventually they reach the Philippines. Um, that's where Magellan dies. That's where his story ends. Um, but it's where the story of the Philippines begins. Because when Magellan arrived, there was no such thing as the Philippines. It was a collection of islands, 120 different languages spoken, dozens of tribes that had no relationship other than trading together. But after Magellan sort of discovers this archipelago on behalf of Spain, Spain begins sending more conquistadors to the Philippines so they can claim it. The Philippines was a very important um, place in the Pacific Ocean for Spain because they had just conquered uh, the Americas, right? They had just created New Spain. Acapulco was their main shipping hub from New Spain. And if they can get a route going from Acapulco to Manila, it means they would have an entire route that spanned across the globe um, that would eventually make them the first global empire. And that's what happened in 1565, Miguel Luis de Legazpi um, conquers uh, Cebu, which was kind of the biggest village of the Philippines at that time, and set the foothold for a colonial battle that would last 300 years. It, it would be 300 years before the entirety of the Philippines would ultimately be under Spanish occupation. Um, and over that time, uh, the, the Philippines as we know it formed. Uh, we became Catholic, uh, we became westernized, and the old agricultural techniques that had been developed for centuries for generations were wiped out in place of more commodity crops like sugar, tobacco, the things that were valuable at the time that were going to bring the most profits to Spain. And, and this sort of set in place uh, a story that we see across the formerly colonized world, which is that once a place gets colonized, what happens is that its own independence um, is no longer a priority that it becomes subservient to the needs of the empire. So it was not about developing or industrializing the Philippines in a way that could allow its own people to subsist and develop skills. It was about what are the crops, what are the labor, what are the things we can use and mine from the Philippines in order to build Spain's wealth. And Spain became the wealthiest empire of that time and for hundreds of years sort of sat at, at the perch as the most powerful global empire. And at this point is where my understanding of my family's history kind of comes into fruition, you know? Um, traveling through Europe, one of the dispiriting things as, as, as a descendant of colonized people is that a lot of our histories um, no longer exist. You know, when Spain conquered the Philippines, a lot of the oral histories, a lot of the written histories uh, were eliminated, were burned. People who held onto the histories were killed. The, 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 the archives um, of, of, of written histories uh, were burned. And this happened all over the world. So I can only speculate on who my descendants were before 1565. But around 1565, I, I do know that my descendants trace to the southern Muslim island of the Philippines, Mindanao, where they were part of a royal family of sultanates. And I sort of, you know, would talk to my mom about this because my mom is very very Catholic. And, you know, she, you know, once I had, a, I, had a, I had a Muslim girlfriend once in high school and she had like a long talk with me about how important it was to like, um, you know, for me to be with someone that, that shared my faith. And it would sort of lead to these discussions about the fact that we actually trace the Muslim blood and that the existence of us being Catholic stemmed from this conquest. You know, so how do you weigh that, right? You, you'd been raised to have these beliefs only to learn that these beliefs were, were instilled into you by foreign invaders. And so my family sort of has this crossroads in, 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 in the 1500s and moving forward. Spain's invading, trying to take them over, and they're resisting. And over the course of generations, they continue that resistance until we get to the point uh, in the late 1800s of my great-great-great-grandmother, Princess Emilia uh, Batubato. Um, she, her father, was a sultan in the region, and it was during his rule that uh, he negotiated a peace treaty with Spain. Um, that peace treaty involved allowing Spain to basically occupy the territory while leaving in place sort of the powers he had in place. And this was the first compromise of many that led to my family's survival throughout the ages. Because for a lot of colonized people, the dilemma ends up being, do you want to continue to resist and risk losing everything? 
Or do you decide to just compromise and save what you can and the power that you've already built um, in order to protect your family moving forward? And that's what happened. And Emilia Batobato, who uh, grew up as a Muslim princess, um, ends up converting to Catholicism, marrying a Spanish soldier, um, and having kids with him um, who they raised Catholic, uh, including one daughter, Luisa, who married uh, another Spanish-blooded person named Jose Concepcion, and that's where the line of my family traces, right? It traces to this compromise between the old world and the new world um, and, and this survival tactic. And that survival tactic is what this sort of persisted over the course of time. It's what led us to want to move to America, right? This, 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 this idea of the American dream uh, was rooted in this mentality that traced all the way back to Amelia. It was this mentality of, 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 you know, to be a colonized person, the aspiration is to cross the bridge into being part of the empire, being part of the colonists. Because if your choice are to be colonized or colonists, you'd much rather be colonists. And that's sort of the, the, the guiding light that has dictated my family's path and, and, and that my, my mother's generation grew up in the Philippines at a time when America had taken over the Philippines from Spain, right? So shortly after my family converts to Christianity in the 1890s, the Spanish-American War begins. Um, the Spanish-American War was initially rooted in a fight over Cuba. The Philippines was sort of a peripheral battle. Um, America takes it over and suddenly everything changes. So we had been, Spain had taught us how to be Catholic, America taught us how to be capitalists and instilled the, 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 the sort of um, hustle culture, the, 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 the mercantile beliefs that came to define uh, the Philippines over the century moving forward. So I'm gonna read a short passage um, from the end of American occupation my grandmother's generation uh, grew up under American occupation. Uh, they went to schools uh, with American teachers who were paid more money to teach in the Philippines than they would have made at home. Uh, they, they, if they were rich enough, they bought American cars. Uh, they saw American cereals on the shelves. To that generation of people, uh, America was the promised land. America brought a variety of, of products um, and opportunities and freedoms that, that, they, that didn't exist uh, to the previous generations. And, and that be began this sort of, uh, this sort of um, dependency that um, our, our family would have with America and the Philippines would have in America moving forward. So this is the story of my grand, -aunt, my grand auntie, Caridad. who was living in the Philippines as a supporter of the American occupation when Japan invaded and seized the Philippines from America. And now she is faced with the same dilemma um, all of the ancestors before her had faced, right? To resist or to submit. Um, and she had to conjure the survival tactics that her descendants had passed down to her. The samurai sword inches above Caridad's head threatened all that was to come. The soldier's accusation was a death sentence, American spy. Nearly every day, Japanese soldiers had brought a group of American POWs into the cafe where Caridad worked, outside a detention camp in rural Luzon, to feed them rice cakes and coffee during breaks from digging roads. One day, a soldier had overheard the prisoners telling Caridad their names while she was taking their orders. As the sword hung above her, Caridad's mind flashed with stories she'd heard of atrocities committed by the Imperial Army. The Filipino men and women detained or killed for failing to bow in the presence of Japanese officers, tortured for listening to American radio broadcasts, publicly beheaded for collaborating with the underground resistance plotting to upend the occupation. The soldier's suspicion was damning in and of itself, even if he couldn't prove it. Truth matters less than the beliefs of those who hold the swords. Caridad's chances of convincing him of her innocence were bleak in any case, but all the more so because she was indeed guilty of being an American spy. Caridad spoke fluent English, had studied U.S. history and literature in school, and listened to American songs on the radio, 
She believed in the democratic principles of the U.S. Constitution and admired the nation's humble beginnings as a former European territory toppling its colonial oppressor before blooming into an empire strong enough to defeat Spain and generous enough to promise the Philippines independence by 1945. Japan's imperial expansion interrupted that plan. Karirat had been stunned and dismayed by how swiftly the tides had turned. The imperial Japanese army had taken over Matsuvesa, much of Asia, driven General Douglas MacArthur and his American forces off the archipelago, and captured the 76,000 U.S. and Philippine troops left behind. If the sword had sliced her skull that day, Caridad would not have made it across the ocean after the war, the first of our barangay to migrate to the States, nor would she have set up the landing point for the rest of us to follow. Her fate was one of countless breaks to swing our way, unnerving reminders that before a moment hardens into the past, it exists in the suspended fragility of the present. Caridad kept cool. She imagined this moment, prepared for it as keenly as she studied for exams or brushed her loose curls before dances. For centuries, her ancestors had dealt with colonizers, studied their desires and prejudices, and learned survival tactics they passed on through generations. Caridad could tell from the soldier's accent that he had learned his English in Great Britain, probably in London, which would peg him as a member of his nation's privileged class, probably reared to internalize a sense of racial superiority over the darker-skinned people who stood as pawns on the global chessboard. An arm of the empire, he was empowered by the might at his back, carrying out duties aimed at elevating his people to their rightful place in the global order, securing a seat at a table long reserved for people of European descent. She was a humble cafe server, earning a paycheck in a poor country unmoored by war, in English deliberately broken and heavily accented with the blunted twang of the provincial natives, she uttered short, harried, declarative bursts that rose in pitch with each word, her tone conveying the shame of a servant ignorant of her misstep. She said she was not a spy. She had merely asked the Americans for their names so she could, so she could submit an itemized bill to the Japanese commandant who usually covered the tab. After a few seconds of contemplation, without another word, the soldier lowered his, lowered his sword, turned on a boot heel, and ordered all the prisoners out of the cafe. Break time was over. The prisoners and soldiers had been coming to the cafe for weeks, and not, one, and not once had any commandant paid for their coffee. So we know what happens next. America wins the war. Filipinos, uh, because of our history um, as, uh, uh, as American subjects, are granted special privileges to come to America. My grand auntie Caridad's status as a member of the underground resistance to the occupation grants her a visa. She moves to San Francisco. She gets married to another Filipino veteran, um, and they buy a house, uh, the house that would be the initial landing point for the rest of my family's arrival in California. Um, 20 years later, my grandmother follows in the footsteps. And by the time I was born in 1989, half of my aunties and uncles had, were in California with the rest to come. By the time I was born, though, that history felt very distant. And the mythology of America as a promised land um, did not, was, was, was not the America that my generation had grown up around. Um, my generation uh, had, had, had grown up in, in, in the shadow of Cold War victory, but at a time when we were living in Vallejo, California, because we could not afford to live in San Francisco, uh, at a time when murder rates were at an all-time high, when the crack epi epidemic was, was, was uh, damaging the communities around us, um, and when the, 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 the sheen of invincibility that America had built after World War II had eroded from the Vietnam War um, and the, the, the lack of trust that followed. So the America we saw was different from the America that my mom saw and her generation saw. They had an old country to compare it to. Um, and in reflection, America had a glimmering sheen. They would tell stories of the corruption in the Philippines um, during the Marcos administration when they had grown up under a dictatorship who had been supported by America. They told stories of uh, the poverty they saw in the streets. They told stories of how everyone around them had dreamed of going America, to America, where, you, where everyone can eat a steak every day, even if you were working class, where everyone could live uh, under a roof um, and not in a shanty, uh, and where a lot of the comforts that they dreamed of in the Philippines were standard common fare in the U.S. You know, they had come of age in the American century, in the decades after World War II, um, and I had come of age at a moment when inequality was widening in America, and that the empire that had stabilized itself in the aftermath of World War II 
was beginning to erode, um, cracks in the foundation beginning to show. And that is the divergence that defines uh, the questions that I came to wonder. Um, the, 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 the difference in the vision that pulled my mom to America, that mythology, and the one I saw around me. Um, what pulled my mom to America was, were, were stories um, told by white people, by white Americans. The speeches by Ronald Reagan, the textbooks um, written that, sh that, that she read in school, written by the Americans in power. Um, the stories I heard were from Tupac, were for the, 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 the athletes on the walls of my bedroom. Uh, these were stories of struggle, of upward mobility, of resistance, um, of oppression. And what I came to realize was that as an immigrant diaspora to America who is neither white nor black, we sort of were dropped in to a long running battle that we were ill-equipped for and had no idea what we were getting into. You know, the first census in America had two races, white, black, and mixed. Um, it would be 200 years almost before they added um, Filipino to the diaspora as well as Indian and, and, and Korean and all so many other races. We are a country of Poles. And those of us who arrived in the time since then have had to navigate where we stand and, and, and what our position is in a place where, where history pushes us, compels us to want to aspire to what white Americans have achieved, while our own experience show us that we're often treated with the same oppression that black people receive. And so it's created this question of whether to push for the progress that black Americans have been pushing for for 300 years, or whether to accept the status quo and buy in and assimilate um, to the old order uh, in, the, in, the, in the fashion of the survival tactics that have allowed my ancestors to survive for so many generations. So when I think about this question of whether my mom's sacrifice was worth it, whether leaving a middle upper class experience in the Philippines um, uh, was worth, the whether the cost of that uh, was worth everything we've gotten in America, and to me, um, the answer is uncertain. To me, the answer comes down to what America becomes, to what uh, we hold it to become. Um, because if America lives up to the ideals that had drawn my mother, even if those ideals were flawed, even if those ideals weren't rooted in historical fact, if it lives up to those ideals, then it will have been worth it. Um, if it does not live up to those, those ideals and, and the slide perpetuates and people who came from colonies, colonized nations uh, will never, uh, are, are continually blocked from, uh, us, from, from reaching uh, the, the, the status quo that, that many white Americans have reached, then it will not have been worth it. Then it, would have been, it will have been trading everything we had built in the old country where we had traced our original roots um, to start from scratch. And that starting from scratch is only worth it if that opportunity to reach what we had reached in the Philippines exists. Otherwise, what we have is this cycle where the wealthy families from formerly colonized nations will be continually sacrificing everything they had built in their old countries in order to start from scratch in the new country. That's the legacy of colonialism. It's, it's middle class families from formerly colonized places moving to the first world, whether that's America, whether that's Western Europe, and starting from scratch which is perpetuating this divide uh, between the global north and the global south. Um, so for it to be worth it, it means that I have to fight for it. It means that my generation has to push for the ideals that, 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 that drew my, my, my mother and her generation here. Um, and, and that's what I came, that's the sort of conclusion I came to by the end of my book, um, is that we are in the middle of a long running story that has no end. Uh, we are part of a young country with phenomenal ideals that were built on, on blood and genocide. Uh, we are a country with sins in our past that continues to be hesitant to reckon with that past. But we are also a country filled with people who have come from places where they see firsthand the impacts of oppression and the impacts of colonialism. And so I think there is no country better positioned to forge a path forward. Thank you. We'd love to take any questions. Sometimes. The question is if my family ever thinks about going back to the Philippines. We talk about it, you know. I know a couple of my uncles and aunts have talked about it. Um, 
you can get like a condo overlooking the beach there for like twenty thousand dollars. You know, like the the exchange rates uh, are very beneficial the other the other way around. You know, um, but I but I think there's a couple of things that have stopped them. I think one is the fact that we've already we've sacrificed so much to be here, right? So to go back to the Philippines would be to distance yourself from the family we have here, right? We don't have, you know, we don't we don't have any relatives still back in the Philippines, at least no one we're close to, um, only sort of extended relatives. So our entire family community is here. So to begin a migration path back there um, would be to sort of create a fracture that uh, could only be sort of, I mean, it, it took us like 20 years, 30 years for my mom's generation to finally all settle in the US. Um, and I think because they had put so much into that, the prospect of just cutting the cord and going back would almost make them question whether they did all that, whether that was all in vain, you know? Um, they continue to hold on to the, the same mythologies that, that pulled them here. Um, and I think it's almost my cousins and, and, and me and my generation who were more open to the idea of going back. You know, my, my cousin who's older than me and grew up in the big house that my mom grew up in always tells me about, all, you know, the maids and the drivers and like, why do we give all that up? Shouldn't we just go back and, and, and live all that again? But that's not our country. You know, like I don't like like we wouldn't be we would be we would be immigrants in our parents country and we ourselves would have we would have money um, because our American dollars would go far there. But we would be starting from scratch socially, culturally, emotionally, um, in a place that we didn't know very well. So for the older generation, the appeal to go back is, 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 isn't there because, because it's a place that they had given so much up to leave. And for the younger generation, the appeal isn't there because it's not our home. It's not the place we know best. We've gotten used to the comforts of American life. You know, we're, we're doing fine in America, right? Our parents' sacrifice has paid off for the generation that followed. And I think the question we just hold on to is like, why was that sacrifice necessary? And that's sort of what, what a lot of the history traces to. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about your Filipino mother, but was your father also Filipino? Oh, my dad's Lebanese. Um, oh. They, they uh, separated early on, so I really just grew up with my mom's side, so I felt culturally Filipino. Um, and I've only sort of started recently exploring my dad's side of the family within the last like two, three years. Was your dad a Christian Lebanese or a Muslim Lebanese? Christian. Yeah. yeah. Also, also very Catholic. Uh, and that was sort of the one thing um, that, that, that bonded them. I mean, the story of how they met uh, is quite interesting. They, um, my mom was a flight attendant um, for um, Saudia Airlines in, in Saudi Arabia, um, where a lot of uh, Filipino immigrants had gone to find work. Um, and my dad was a businessman. Um, who's flying that airline and he was flying first class and he like asked for a phone number and then like that led to their relationship. Um, but they, they never lived together. They were always separated. Um, they never married in church. They married in like Vegas in like a joke kind of way, but it was like official. Um, but, but because they never married in church, neither of them really thought it, it counted. They, but then they officially divorced shortly afterwards. Um, but I was fully, I, I didn't know I was a secret child. Like my, my dad's side didn't know I existed. Um, so I was fully immersed with, with, with my mom's side. So f culturally I felt hundred percent Filipino. It's only within the last couple of years I've been exploring the other side. Have you visited the Philippines? I have, yes. Yeah, a couple of times. Most recently in uh, 2017. Yes? About the, the culture, some of the cultures and the ways they are being decimated for 300 years. To what extent are the people that still live there trying to hold on to the old ways and the old cultures? How far back is that information available, those ways, those medicinal ways, those, the food you know, and, and whatnot? There, there are, there are, there, uh, it's, it's not a lot, right? Because I think that the challenge is, um, it's sort of a, a, a luxury, a privilege to try to preserve the past, right? And like Maslow's hierarchy of needs for people that are much more focused on, you know, paying the bills every day, that's not a big priority. But there are, um, not even indigenous cultures, but people that hold on to indigenous ways in the more provincial areas of the Philippines, especially in the South, where my family's from, um, they have a, a lot of pride in their history because it was like a whole sultan, sultanic empire. Um, so there's a much, there's a bit more sort of um, like lineage, like you can find a lot of, um, family tree charts in that part of the Philippines. Um, 
you can find a lot of oral histories that did survive just at least for the last 500 years. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, I think in, in the South, you can probably trace back the very bare bones of like who were the sultans tracing back before um, for about 500 years. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff that's lost is the texture, the color, the actual stories and anecdotes. I, I think at this point, what has survived is, you know, the medicinal ways have survived. You know, people have always kept passing that down no matter who was in charge. Um, the family tree branches have survived, um, but, the, but, uh, but kind of the majority of stories, anecdotes, and traditions have fallen, mm. fallen away. Oh, that's great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for writing your book. This is really poignant to me. I myself as an immigrant and having lived and experienced as a, related to your parent, your mother, as well as a writer. And I just, uh, I'm so touched. I'm so grateful of your experience. Thank you. My question for you is that you talked about your mixed um, culturally, politically, whatever way, treated as a mixed category, neither white nor black mixed one. Explain more about your own experience, not your parent generation, your experience. I'm very curious about that. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, we, um, me and my Filipino friends would always joke that, so Filipino identity has always been tough to define, largely because of that history of colonialism where there, 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 there is no sort of shared unified culture, right? Like because the Philippines didn't exist as an entity before Spain came, there's sort of not the, 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 the there's no Filipino identity independent of being colonized by the same country. That's what we had in common. We were all colonized by the same country and we we're all sort of in the same archipelago. And so growing up, um, I, there was always Filipino people in my, in my class in school, um, but we didn't really, we sort of, we knew about like the cuisine and we knew a couple of words um, and we supported Manny Pacquiao, but it was all very surface level. But culturally, the joke, and this is from, there was a movie uh, starring Dante Bosco from 2001 called The Debut. Um, and it was the first time I had seen multiple Filipinos on screen. It was the first movie I'd seen that was about Filipino culture. And there's a joke in that movie where they say there are two types of Filipinos, Filipinos who act white and Filipinos who act black. And that was sort of the divergence that uh, existed between me and my friends, is that I, there were the Filipinos I knew that like, that wore like puka shell necklaces and spiked their hair and listened to Blink-182. And then there are the Filipinos I knew who got like faded up their hair or got braids and wore like jerseys of, of, uh, of, of athletes um, and, and, um, and listened to rap music. I was part of the latter. I definitely I grew up in Vallejo, which is the capital of uh, Northern California hip hop. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood that had previously been segregated for black people. Uh, the house that my grand auntie Caridad had bought in San Francisco uh, was in the Fillmore district, which was a segregated district that had previously been um, Japanese. And then when internment swept all of the Japanese people out, black people who were migrating on the Great Migration, this was the only place that they were able to go because there was available properties. Um, and it became what was called the Harlem of the West at that time with a lot of beep, bebop joints and, and jazz joints, Coltrane and Miles Davis would play there. Um, so my family is always existed adjacent to, to black culture. And so that was the culture that sort of defined my generation's upbringing in America. And it was the reason why the stories of America we learned were the stories that black people were telling um, in, in, in the Bay Area. So for me, it, it took time because that growing up, I sort of, my identity was all refracted through all the other identities that were not my own. And it took me until adulthood um, and exploring that with me and my other Filipino friends of, of figuring out, well, what is our history? What is our culture? Um, and, and how do we sort of define that? Um, but it was a challenge of breaking free from centuries of this aspiration to assimilate. You know, just as my great great grandmother Emilia wanted to be, well, you know, converted to to, to um, Catholicism and, and married a Spaniard, just like my um, great auntie Caridad fought in the resistance against the Japanese occupation on behalf of the U.S. And just like my mom's generation migrated to the U.S., we were always striving to be like the, the, the people in power. And I had to eventually come out of that by studying my own history and learning more about indigenous Filipino culture. 
and tracing. And, and the thing that was important too for me was actually tracing back my lineage to the actual like island we came from and knowing that it wasn't just sort of this ambiguous Filipino culture, but it was a specific Northern Mindanao culture that we had traced to. And it was also accepting that it's okay if there is no distilled, you know, pure distillation of Filipino identity. It's okay if our identity is a bit of a pastiche of Spanish culture, American culture, black American culture, this kind of global identity that colonialism will, you know, inevitably instill in us. It's okay to embrace that. And I think that was the piece I ultimately came to is that this, 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 um, Filipino identity I had long been searching for didn't actually exist in the way I thought it did. That it was actually this combination of a bunch of things. And that's okay. That, that was the culture that, 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 that I grew up in. Um, and it just took me some time to understand what that meant. Yes. Um, with your family in San Francisco, how have the crazy economic situation that's happened there, um, cost of living and value of houses and all that kind of stuff. Well, how has that affected your family? A lot, you know, no, none of them are left there. You know, the, that was the place that we first landed, but it's not the place that we stayed. My mom just moved out of it. My mom had been living in, in the original house that my um, grand auntie Curry Dot had bought in the Fillmore in San Francisco. She just moved out this summer. Uh, my, my older cousin, um, he just, him and his wife and his kids just moved out. Um, we're all sort of in Vallejo and Sacramento now, um, kind of flowing with that, that, that migration to affordable housing eastward. Mm -hmm. microphone. Um, yeah, I, I just want to compliment your, your talk. I, I, I think you're, inc I mean, to hear that history from the 1500s or 1400s to now, um, so succinctly, very well done and, and without sort of politics and bitterness, it brings out the complexity of it, which I, I just... Thank you. I want to thank you for that. Yeah, um, I, I've worked with immigrants and immigrants' children like throughout my whole life, and um, it was uh, you know what I've often come across is it doesn't take very long for even the immigrants themselves to lose a con to, to really not have a full connection to either place, right? You, you can't go back because then you're bringing back your U.S. Your experience with you. It was interesting. You started out posing it as an economic question. And moved into like the more cultural, psychological thing. So I think that's it's just all so wound up together. Um, so anyway, that's just comments. But um, my question, I guess, so one one reason I think that many, um, you know, in my life, the people I, I don't know so much about the Philippines, but I've dealt with a lot of Africans and, and Latin Americans who have come. Many times, it's the uh, wealthier people, middle class people, who come because they have the resources to come. Um, but also, I don't know that. They leave behind a lot, but they may be uh, forced to do things that they don't feel good about in order to do well and, and survive in, in countries which thrive on corruption, among other things. And clearly, that's a factor in the Philippines um, with um, what's Duarte. And, and mm -hmm. um, so I guess I want, I don't know, just looking for comments and what you think about that. But yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's tough, right? So like the question of would they want to move back? It's like, yeah, the Philippines is now under uh, a person that a lot of people consider a tyrant, right? And, and um, that said, uh, most people in my family do support Duterte and do think he's, he's for, for the best. And I wrote an essay a few years ago, and I do address it in the book too. Um, that was part of my distance between my generation and my mom's generation, which is that I had come up as an American thinking like, Oh, this guy's um, stepping on democratic norms and like, you know, expressing tyrannical power. That's not good. We're rolling back the democratic norms that we had built over the last half century. Um, but they were like, you don't, you don't get it. You're looking at it from an American perspective where you have faith in institutions and they don't have faith in institutions. So for them growing up under a dictatorship um, and then seeing that dictatorship overthrown, and then seeing the series of presidents following that dictatorship fail to actually upend the, the, the social inequalities and the old um, oligarchical order has made them a bit delusioned, disillusioned about um, the, the efficacy of liberal democracy. And so when a uh, strong man comes in and says, no, I'm going to fix all this, no more corruption, they're thinking like, finally, someone's like going to do something about these problems that 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 caused us to leave. That 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 we've wanted someone to to fix. Um, so so to them it wasn't necessarily 
Um, Duterte is not the reason they didn't want to come back, but their support for him was reflective of the conditions that they didn't want to come back to. The fact that they were willing to support him was because they had so little faith in the institutions of the Philippines. And that for all that, while they had, tr while they had sort of slipped down the class hierarchy, what they had gotten in exchange were a, was a country with institutions that they could trust, where they didn't have to pay a bribe at the post office to ship a box. And they didn't have to pay a bribe when they arrived um, in the airport at the customs office, where they could live in the freedom of, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 the developed world, where people around them weren't so desperate that they had to worry about thievery at every corner. So I think they feel like it was a fair enough trade-off. Um, and I think they feel like if they were to go back while they would have more kind of economic thrust in their bank accounts and their dollars would go further, they would also have to go back to a way of living that I don't think they want to return to. Thank you. So I, I was very, uh, the remark you made about this is the first time you wrote something with I and me in it, you'd never written that before. So, uh, the reflection required to produce a memoir is, I, I gather, is very intense. And also, recently there have been comments that that writing a memoir, that the memoir genre in itself is a form of creative nonfiction. So the creativity part in telling the story and what you select and what you don't select. But I'm very interested, what did you learn about yourself having written this? Not about your parents or about anybody else, but what did you learn through the process of writing this reflective memoir? I, I think I learned what it meant to be American. You know, like as someone who grew up, you know, I grew up in Northern California during the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. So I grew up on stories of American tourists putting on Canadian flag pins on their backpacks so that when they traveled abroad, people wouldn't associate them with, you know, the embarrassment of invade, you know, of imperial invasions and stuff. So, uh, you know, I grew up in a in a, in a place that was very much rooted in this resistance against the American way, right? Bay Area, you know, home of the Black Panthers and the Weather Underground and, and, and all these resistance movements of the past, right? And so I had sort of grown up with this, this sort of, you know, taking it for granted that like superpowers are bad and empires are bad. And that didn't mean everyone in America was bad, but it meant that we were sort of complicit in this system of global oppression where we benefited from like things like the, the the cars we buy are cheaper because they're now being built in countries where you can pay people less right so i sort of internalized all that and i think what i, I came to appreciate about my like understanding about myself was that sort of the, the the duty of being american is to not only reckon with the sins of the past but sort of use the power responsibly and that i didn't have to that sort of the shame I felt was tied to the version of America that had had drawn my mom and 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 my my elders, but that the version of America that I grew up with, the things that I was proud of, you know, the our history of resistance and resilience and reckoning was just as valid, and I hadn't given that enough weight, um, but only on looking back on my own life and realizing like, oh, that's right, I knew who Huey Newton was when I was 10 years old because I was listening to Tupac. Or, you know, I knew about poverty in um, Delta, Mississippi because, you know, my favorite player, Jerry Rice, grew up, you know, laying bricks with his dad down there. Where sort of these are stories of the other side of America were, were, were sort of just as valid. Um, I think that's the, that's the answer that comes to mind. Um, but I think also from like a, a, a deeper level, um, sort of this understanding of what my responsibility was to fulfill the ambitions and sacrifices of my elders and what that means. And I don't know if I ever came to an answer on that, you know, like it, is it as simple as like supporting them financially and making sure I call them regularly? Um, or is there something more, you know? And I think the, the, the thing, the, the, the thing I learned most about myself is that I still sort of hold on to this unresolved question um, that I think, which I think the child of every immigrant faces, which is that, you know, my immigrant mother, you know, um, taught me contrasting lessons. 
on one hand, she taught me the lesson that America is the place to be. It's a place worth sacrificing for. She sacrificed all this so that I could have the benefits of growing up here. On the other hand, if a place that you are from becomes unbearable for you, you can always leave. And I sort of reached the end of the book facing that question. I, this book, um, I filed the final draft of this book in the day before the, day before the election in November 2020. Um, so those final pages, the final chapter was written in the summer of 2020 when it looked like everything was collapsing. And me and my friends were all like, so do we want to go to Mexico City or Toronto or Lisbon if the Civil War happens? Or do we want to stay on the front lines and fighting it, you know? Um, and, I th and I think that the conclusion I came to at the end of the book was that I would want to stay w with w this idea that this is a country worth fighting for because there is no perfect place. That you can go to the next place with its own problems, but this is a powerful place that used to be a colony and that is filled with a massive population of people who know what the sins of imperialism are. So who better to be in charge of the most powerful country than people that know the consequences of, of, of the abuse of power? Um, and it sort of helped me see through the writing process of this book um, why I wanted to stay. And it helped me find a pathway towards being proud of my country, which is something that everyone should you know, find a peace toward. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, yeah. I'm just curious, um, after all this uh, history and everything you've been through to you know, deal with your identity and consciousness and political thought and all that and what your family has been through, do you have a sense of like what economic level you feel comfortable with and at what economic level does that become oppressor in and of itself? It's a, I, I, I think about that all the time. Um, that's like central to the next book I want to write, this idea of like consumer complicity. Um, I don't know because like it's, it's sort of self, it's self-interested for me to say like that the bar is more money than I have now, you know? Like yeah, maybe billionaires shouldn't exist, you know? Like we could probably tax people that make more than half a billion dollars more and it would make a massive difference. Um, like that's what I tell myself when I like order something from Amazon or take an Uber, you know, or go to McDonald's, um, knowing that I'm supporting these institutions that are like benefiting from and perpetuating economic inequality. Um, I, I, I don't know where the line ends, but I know it starts that like let's start let's start with the idea that like we don't need to have billionaires right that people can exist comfortably and happily with like you know 500 million dollars right but shit ask me that question when i'm a billionaire and i'll probably have a different answer you know um so i don't know but or maybe not i hope not i hope not you know but but i think that's the the, the, the i think the tough thing the frustrating thing is that like i say that and many of you guys probably agree because it seems so obvious, but you know here we still are. You know, even though billionaires are such a small proportion of our actual population, and even though it very clearly benefits the vast majority of us, that let's at least like not we don't even have to say billionaires shouldn't exist. Let's at least like go back to the tax rates of like. 1955, right? And that's the thing, right? There are a lot of people who be talking about the 50s as the golden age. Well, part of the reason there was such, you know, egalitarianism compared to now in the 50s or like mid 60s, let's say, after the civil rights movement um, was because the top tax rate was 94%. You know, when Reagan came into office, the top tax rate was still 78%. When he left office, it was 28%. So we're like, there's this sort of assumption that the way it's been now is rooted in the way it's always been. But the inequality we're seeing expanding now very directly ties to clear policy changes that have happened over the last half century. And the fact that it's so obvious and yet it hasn't changed speaks to the dysfunction, the dysfunction of it all, right? Um, so I, I, I don't know where the line would be. Um, 
but I think the line begins with at least like, like let's if the top if the top tax rate is like fifty percent for people that make over five hundred million dollars, that would like make an, which is still less than it was you know before Reagan. That would make an incredible difference in the amount of services that we'd be able to fund, right? So it 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 it's it doesn't require um, revolutionary change to make life better for the majority of people. The question is whether it takes revolutionary change to actually move the needle in that direction, right? And I think that's the question. That's the question we face today. Thank you, Albert. Your enthusiasm yeah. and knowledge leaps from the pages of your book, which is for sale over here at Anecdote Books. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Appreciate the time. Cheers.